Hey, good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. If we haven't got to meet yet, it's good to see you here today. If you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, turn to Luke chapter 13, Gospel of Luke, third book in the New Testament, chapter 13. We'll pick up in verse 10 there in just a minute. Uh, we have two more weeks of our Encounters with the Jesus series, and I'm just going to tell you up front, one of my goals today was to do something weird, and so we're going to do something weird in our story today. Uh, our friend Aaron Bauer from Issaquah Christian is going to be here next week to close out our Encounters with Jesus series. Many of you were here when he served for just shy of 17 years as well. And if you remember, uh, as he was mourning the death of his daughter earlier this year, uh, several of us helped uh, him cover about 10 weeks of preaching. And we did this series in name for him. And so now he gets to come here and close it out for us the following week. And so be sure and welcome him warmly next week. I'll be glad to see him there. Um, I never know if some of my childhood experiences are unique to me or because Texas is a crazy place or... So let's do some group therapy slash uh, surveys today. Okay, uh, growing up in school, did y'all do like scoliosis tests with a school nurse? Ever was this a thing? All right, I don't know why all of a sudden, like in third grade, this was like a big deal. Like we went from like missing kids on milk cartons to like everybody has scoliosis. And so, but... <laughs> When I stepped foot into the school nurse's office, and there's a lot of exaggerations there. Uh, my wife is a nurse, nurse practitioner. She's brilliant, uh, very, very smart. There is not a chance that our school nurse was actually a nurse. And so you walked into, like, whatever her letters were, they weren't RN, BSN at the end, okay? So, but you walked in, and when I mean walk into her office, I mean you walk into the double-wide trailer uh, that was half the nurse's office and half the in-school detention kids. So when you got, like, in real trouble, but not enough to have to go home, and they kept you there, and so fake nurse over here, bad kids over here, and so the nurse would have you, like, stand with your back against the wall and, like, like lining up a kick, you know, in a football game and go, okay, good. Like, and then she'd have you sit down and she'd, you know, fill your spine for like three tenths of a second and go, all right, good. And like, that was it. And I, like, I don't know what scoliosis is if a bunch of people had it. That can't be the actual way to check for it. But like every year in the first few weeks of school, we'd go in and check for this uh, back problem. Um, if you've seen uh, in Shakespeare's plays, King Richard III is frequently uh, portrayed as having this horrendous back problem. Um, I think when Kevin Spacey played him, he had this leg sort of popped in like this, and his, he's like a hunchback sometimes. Uh, and so it's been kind of commonly thought of that he had this horrific back problem where he's all bent over crooked. Um, and like maybe, but there's also eyewitness accounts of him being really courageous in battle it seemed like he could stand up and fight pretty well. And so uh, in 2012, at some strip mall parking lot in England, they found the bones of King Richard III. I don't know how they didn't like, look and go, hey, there he is. I don't know. Like, but they found him, did whatever tests British people do. You know, they go, hey, this is our guy. And so they did some studies, and they found out he wasn't a hunchback. He didn't have this big leg problem. He just had severe scoliosis that came into his life as uh, a teenager. Uh, Usain Bolt also has scoliosis, who so is the fastest man alive. So like, I don't know how big a deal this is or why we got so scared of this thing at one point. But in today's passage, we're going to encounter a woman who has such a severe back problem, and all the men ages 50 and up said amen. Like she's bent over and she can't, she can't function. Your Bible's going to have a few different headings of ways to describe her disability, but for 18 years, she's had this horrendous back problems, and then she has an encounter with Jesus that changes both her physical and her spiritual life. So we're going to read Luke chapter 13. We'll read 10 through 21, pray, and then begin our time in God's Word together. Luke writes this in verse 10. Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit. Anybody's Bible say something different there? Shout it out. Spirit of infirmity. Spirit of infirmity. Okay, good. By a spirit of eight. What'd you say, Mary? Crippled by a spirit. Crippled by a spirit. Okay, yeah. Uh, Bible translations don't quite know how to describe this. We'll get to what's really going on in just a minute. But whatever she's got going on, she's had it for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Verse 12. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And when he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, 
said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, verse 15, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Verse 18, he said, therefore, this is one of the only times this word appears in Luke's gospel, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? It's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful each and every week we get a chance to come together as a family of faith under the authority of your word. Uh, God, thanks for the way that you encounter this woman. May her encounter with you uh, change the way we encounter you today. God, we're not here for information about a weird story or about uh, analogies for the kingdom. We're here to be transformed by you. And so help us be formed more and more into the image of your son. Make our church more and more faithful to you. Uh, God, as we celebrate today Rachel's time on staff, we give you thanks for the joy she's brought into our church, the way she's led us so well. We just pray nothing but blessings on her and this next opportunity for her. God, as I woke up this morning to headlines of attacks on Israel on the other side of the world, God, would you bring peace where there is violence? God, would you protect the lives of civilians, especially women and children? God, and show the church how to labor in prayer well, how to trust you uh, deeply. And God, we just confess that we don't always know uh, what to do or how to pray. When we see videos of young women thrown on the backs of motorcycles and taken off to who knows what, God, we know that you're there in those dark places with them. Would you show us what's good and right for us to respond? And God, help us, I think, even resist the temptation to feel like prayer is sort of the only thing we can do, or like a last resort. God, thanks for all the gospel witnesses you have on the ground there in a region that is crying out to you in so many different ways. Jesus, would you be seen as the Messiah, the promised one of Israel, really loudly these days? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you missed uh, last week, Pastor Henry Furman was here from Shelter Rock Church in Long Island. Greg Ferris, former pastor and co-worker, and he led our men's retreat, did an excellent job walking us through the word there and camped out on this woman caught in adultery. And one of the nuggets that I thought I loved that so captivated my attention as I sat where you sit last week was the, the way Jesus actually not only encountered her, but encountered those religious leaders too encountered them in their hypocrisy, invited them into uh, a a journey of following him, a journey which they uh, refused, but Jesus' offer is still good for them uh, as well. And this theme of the hypocrisy of uh, religious leaders is something that we see picked up again in today's passage. And so as we saw earlier, there's all different kinds of headings and ways to translate what actually is wrong with this woman Uh, a disabling spirit, a spirit of infirmity, but you see Jesus clarifies what the real problem is, right? It's not that this woman has back issues or severe scoliosis, it's that Satan has a hold of her life, that this is now a, a demonic issue, not a physical issue. The primary thing Jesus is gonna do is to heal this woman, save her, but deliver her from uh, the enemy. So let me kind of set the scene here. In context, Jesus has just kind of laid the hammer down on this, hey, there really is a line in the sand. You either repent and follow Jesus, his way into the kingdom, or you perish and spend life separated from Jesus eternally in hell. And Jesus draws this line in the sand, graciously invites all people to be a part of the kingdom of which he is the king. But then you see these characters, especially in the Gospel of Luke, you see outsiders brought into the kingdom. You see, quote unquote, insiders separating themselves from the true kingdom. And so Jesus would have been invited to speak at the synagogue. You see a handful of times Jesus seems just to walk up and interrupt and grab a scroll and start going. Uh, It was common practice for any guest speaker in a synagogue to be invited by the synagogue leader. 
So that cat who stands up and starts kind of trying to spin what Jesus had said, like he goes, what I heard Jesus saying was, you know, he, he's doing that. But he's the one who would have invited Jesus to be there. And I love this woman is there. Look at what we learn about her there in verse 11. Disabling spirit, demonic possession here for 18 years. Bent over and could not fully straighten herself. You know what I love it doesn't say? It doesn't say Jesus met her in the town square. It doesn't say Jesus pulled uh, Zacchaeus and saw this gal in a tree or went over to her house. Where is she when she meets Jesus? In the synagogue. So notice what she's doing. For 18 years, she's been confused, hurt, questioning, has to be some level of angry towards God, but she keeps showing up. She's there to worship God. No doubt has people on a prayer chain praying for her, praying for a physical healing. But this is one of the hangups in certain versions of Christianity. Is like if there's a level of sickness or illness, surely that's outside of God's will. And we just need to believe more. And we just need to pray more. And then, and then God will heal our physical bodies. Sometimes. And isn't it wonderful when he does that? But what an eternal gift the healing of heaven is and will be for each one of us. And so even in this room, I see people who have been in the hospital for six weeks recently, back with us. I see people who lost a loved one this last week. I see people we have funerals scheduled for this next week. And so this is not a, a, a foreign story to us, is it? This concept of something is physically wrong and we're calling out to God, asking him to be healer. And sometimes he heals physically and sometimes he doesn't, at least in an immediate sense. God always heals his people eternally, but the woman is there. And so to you today, if you have uh, frustrations, if you're angry with God, if you're confused or hurt or you don't know why this answer, this prayer isn't being answered, at least in the way in which we would have liked, maybe it feels like you're asking God for a good thing. You don't need, we, we've been, I've showed this before, we, we, we didn't want a bigger house. We just wanted a child for a long time. And God just kept saying no or, or wait. We, we at one point wanted more than we have now. Now I feel like we're good. But, <laughs> but God said no. And it was like, well, God, I'm not asking for a Ferrari. I just want another kid who's going to disobey me, like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> but you've got to just keep showing up. Do you think we're going to get answers out there? A away from God's presence, away from God's people? Some of us have tried that, yeah? And then you kind of zoom out and ask that question, well, how'd that, how'd that go for us? When we tried to find answers on our own, when we left, when we punted on our faith, how did that go? I bet before too long, that anger turned into bitterness and turned into just a settled state of opposition against God and his ways. But this woman keeps showing up, and I just love that. I love that she doesn't go up to Jesus. You see this a handful of times in the Gospels, right? People, especially those who want physical healing, are just trying to grab the edge of Jesus' tunic. They're lunging at him. This woman doesn't move towards Jesus. She doesn't say anything to Jesus. Jesus goes to her. This is the initiating heart of God, right? We love God because he first loved us in Christ, that God saved us, made a path for us to know him when we were not looking for him, and we weren't just neutral and are not looking. We were set up against him as God's enemies, righteous recipients of the wrath of God. That's our position outside of Christ. But in Christ, God moved towards us. Before we asked him to, before we wanted him to, God moves towards us. Jesus moves towards this woman. He approaches her. And let's not underestimate her need. Uh, some of you, when we start talking about demons and spiritual oppression, you're like, finally. <laughs> and some of us get real weirded out by that. I would say some Christians think about this way too much, and some Christians think about it not enough. The truth of the scripture is that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So you don't ultimately need to worry about any of that stuff. But denying the existence of the fact that we have an enemy is foolishness for you and for me. So tell me later if you've had like a spiritual oppression story. But I'm going to share with you mine because I have a microphone today and you don't, okay? <laughs> the one time I've ever felt anything like this. Uh, I was a youth pastor. We had brought in... A uh, professor from seminary and some other uh, kind of mental health experts. This was 10 years ago. 
and uh, talked to some students, uh, and then we had a bunch of people, men and girls and guys at the time, struggling with different levels of eating disorders. Uh, and so we had like a medical doctor, we had a, a seminary professor come in and just share God's design for our bodies to thrive, and what it means to flourish, and how food is a good gift from him, and some of y'all say amen, and so like, but it was a, it was a great conversation, but like some things, uh, that conversation prompted a bunch of other conversations, right? And so I was meeting with this mom who was angry because her daughter had shared an eating disorder that the mom knew about, but she didn't want us to know about it. And so she comes in to my office, and she talks, and she's um, uh, normal at first. Like, I've talked to this gal a bunch of times, but somewhere in the middle of our conversation, like, her face starts to distort and change. Like, my office got cold, and it was in the hottest room in our church. It's where you stick the youth pastor sometimes. And so, like, Jake's office is pretty sweet. He has a little separate office behind there, but this wasn't that kind of place. And so my office all of a sudden got cold, and she started to kind of snarl a little bit when she talked. And it just was very, very, very unsettling. Because you can see God in her daughter is trying to bring some darkness into light. And there was some level of darkness in the mom that didn't want darkness to be dragged into the light. And in that conversation, we went from normal to something demonic to normal again. And I didn't take an exorcism class in seminary. I don't know how to, just, we just prayed and talked, and eventually the mood changed. But like to say that we definitely know that's not what was happening in that room that day would be foolish of us. And so imagine some level of demonic possession of this woman for 18 years. And so Jesus moves towards her in a minute of, of great need. But notice how Jesus heals her, right? She doesn't say anything. She doesn't do anything. He moves to her and declares with the power of his word, woman, which remember we talked about last week, is this term of great affection in the first century ancient Near East. Jesus says, woman, you have been delivered. You've been saved. You have been healed. So if you're tracking in the story, as you're looking at uh, the Bible here, verse 12, when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. That's where healing happens, at the period at verse 12, right? So then look at verse 13. And he, Jesus, laid his hands on her. Why? He doesn't need to. Does Jesus have like 80% word power, but then 20% knuckle power? That's not how this works. Jesus has always been, which means the word of God is what spoke galaxies into existence. Jesus isn't like mostly powerful enough to hear from his words. He says she's been delivered. That's when she's delivered. But then Jesus does what some other people undoubtedly wouldn't be willing to do, which is he comes up even closer. And he puts his hands on her in respect and love. We might say it like this. Jesus is unnecessarily compassionate. And this is not something that Jesus does once then. This is still how Jesus works today. I bet if we walked around the room and gave a microphone up and out, we could probably share some stories of how Jesus has been unnecessarily compassionate to you and me. Like salvation is already way better than we deserve. Aren't you glad God's not fair? My goodness, what a great deal it is for you and me. But we're brought into, we're adopted into God's family, a position that we don't deserve to have. And then he keeps on blessing us, Yeah. Some of you have spouses and kids and f friends and neighbors and a place to live, and nobody came to your door with a gun and tried to kidnap your family. And like, we are a blessed people right now. And there's a great responsibility to steward that well, but Jesus has been unnecessarily compassionate to each one of us here today. And so, then what does she respond with? If I were her, gosh, wouldn't you want to like lay into some of these religious leaders? 18 years, demonic back problems, bent over, you keep showing up. She's got to come with a whole laundry list of extra needs that have to become weary at some point. I might just be going off on a whole bunch of people if I'm her, but she doesn't do that. Immediately she was made straight and she glorified God, verse 13. I don't know what she did. Sang, praised, jump up and down, did some jumping jacks for the first time, some back squats. I don't know, something she couldn't do before. High five, Jesus. I mean, she is excited for an encounter with Jesus. Verse 14, with the ruler of the synagogue, dun, dun, dun. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Okay, this is a miracle, like God has done something that's crazy and 
Um, it can be discouraging sometimes, I think, when we read about all these miracles in the scriptures and go, ah, why aren't we seeing that today? Like, we'll ask something like, why is the book of Acts so awesome? We won't consider why the book of 1 Corinthians is so uh, immoral. And we'll sort of over-romanticize one sliver of the early church. But there is true. There's all kinds of miracles and healings, and we need to see, we think, more of that. And like, maybe, but in the New Testament at least, miracles serve a distinct purpose. Okay, their job is to verify the divine claims of Jesus. They're to get eyeballs on Jesus so that when he says, hey, I am the way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father but by me, there's actually people to hear it. So when Jesus claims to be God, which he does over and over and over again, he's doing it right here, healing a woman with voice on the Sabbath in the synagogue, only God could ever do something like that. And so in this passage, Jesus doesn't say word for word, I am God, but every bit of his actions points towards that claim. And so miracles in our day are not a a thing we should overly strive for or be used as a sort of a benchmark for discerning the authenticity of someone's faith. But in the New Testament, they serve this distinct purpose to verify the countless times Jesus shows up and claims to be God. And so now we get the ruler of the synagogue, verse 14, the one who would have invited Jesus. He starts fussing at Jesus. This is so inconvenient. She can come any other day she wants to. Why does she have to come today to get healed on the Sabbath? Ugh. It's supposed to be a day, day of rest. Jesus is the only one that did any work. They didn't have to do anything. They just watched him heal the woman he created in his own image. He reveals, though, the hypocrisy, verse 15, to you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, look at the way Jesus gives her uh, dignity and worth, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Do you catch this wordplay happening? We're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, and so there is no donkey or ox that's supposed to go and plow a field, but they have to be cared for on the Sabbath still. And so this synagogue ruler is willing to tell his people, it's okay for you to untie an ox, take it to water. It's not okay for Jesus to untie this woman from Satan's grasp. We're talking about leading an ox to water one day a week, and she hasn't had a day of freedom, a taste of the living water for 18 years. So, and, and God's law is good. The Sabbath comes from God's law. The Torah, the first five books of the Bible, there's 613 commands. And they function on a few different levels. They, they show us the holiness of God. They show us that the best way to live. And they ultimately show us that we can't do what it takes to live up to that measure. Okay, so anytime you're in the first five books of the Bible, you're encountering one of those three realities, right? God is holy. He showed us how to live. And we can't do it on our own. But, but God's law is good. The heart of the law is good. Jesus didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. And so for us now as New Testament Christians, all the law has been fulfilled in Christ. But the giving of it isn't supposed to be an evil thing for us. It's a good thing. Sabbath is a good gift. But religious people take good things and make them bad. Kind of the analogy is like if, uh, if you have a pasture or something, and God puts us in the pastures. You can roam anywhere in here. Just don't cross, don't jump the fence and cross the highway. You just get hit by a truck. And so then a farmer goes, okay, well, just so we don't get close to the edges, we'll build a smaller fence inside of God's fence. We'll, we'll do another mini pasture in there so that we really don't get close to the edge of potential disobedience. So these religious leaders are doing. And so there's rabbinical texts you can still read in Jewish synagogues today where this dialogue of some rabbi hundreds of years ago declared that just so we don't get close to work, we can't even untie oxen. I guess they're just supposed to go thirsty for a day until the next day. Orthodox Jews today won't even flip on a light switch. So if you hang out with an Orthodox Jew on Shabbat, on Sabbath and Saturday, you have to flip the switch for them. They'll let you do it, but they just can't do it. Because we've gotten so, we've taken a good gift from God and, and twisted it into our own liking. And it's easy to maybe kind of poke fun of how other people do that, but don't we do this the same way? Pick your flavor of sin. Whatever you're afraid, we'll ask these questions. Say, hey, how far is too far? How far can I get to the edge? All oh, those are wrong questions. God's given us freedom within his 
boundaries. The psalmist writes that the boundary lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. Boundaries are a good thing, a good gift from the Lord. His law, his teaching is good for you and me. But if we're not careful, we'll become so religious and we'll twist it up and add a bunch of extra stuff to it. That's like the whole reason the book of Galatians is in your Bible, that we are free in Christ. And so we're not arguing about God's law here. We're arguing about how it's been distorted in such a way that it actually got in the way of the embodiment of the heart of God to move towards sinners like this woman and like you and me. Verse 17 is a great nugget. As he said these things, just an utter mic drop moment from Jesus. All his adversaries were put to shame. That's such an awesome clause. I love that. Look at how many times the word all is in this verse. All adversaries put to shame. All the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. You just come away from the story going, okay, Jesus is Lord. Well, like that's the takeaway from the first seven or eight verses is that Jesus is Lord. He created this woman before the foundations of the world. The same voice that spoke cosmos into being, cast Satan out of this woman's body, called her into right relationship with God, shut down her opponents, and led everyone to glorify everything Jesus did. I wonder today, do you and me marvel at all the things Jesus is doing? I kind of think we love most of what Jesus is doing. And Jesus can pick up on this propensity of us, as in the next few verses. Okay, so if Jesus is Lord, if he's king of the kingdom, what does life in the kingdom look like for you and me, there's two parables he tells in four short verses at the end here. First in verse 18, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? I love when Jesus asks questions to himself. And then he answers them. Verse 19, it's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. Jesus wants you and me to see that the kingdom of God exponentially changes us out there. The kingdom of God exponentially, quantitatively, and qualitatively changes us for life out there. A farmer sows a seed, a mustard tree grows, it gives shade and blesses other people, and slowly over time, it expands. Google mustard seed stuff on your phone, and you'll see like a 10, 15, 20 feet tall bush. It's huge. And if you look at this ragtag group of disciples who do not know what Jesus is saying, and the Bible's full of all of his opponents, Jesus dies, resurrects from the grave, walks around in this I'm not dead tour, and then at his ascension in Acts 1, there's a buck 20 people with him. Wouldn't you think there'd be more than that? I mean, 120 people is all that, but you look at the world now, more of the world is reached by the gospel of Jesus Christ than not. You can just zoom out and statistically see it is working. The kingdom is advancing. The Great Commission is becoming imminently more uh, reachable in our lifetime. There's homeless men and women on the streets that have a smartphone in their pockets. <laughs> There's people across the world that don't have clean water, but they have access to the internet. Like, this is a doable thing. In this generation, we can see the kingdom of God growing just like it does in your life and mine. And so we might fall prey of wanting these miracle-like moments of divine healing and exploding growth, but the reality of the kingdom of God is it just keeps marching on. And over the arc of the last 2,000 years, certainly before the internet and technology, 1,300 years before the printing press, the gospel crosses oceans. It's on different continents within a generation or two of Jesus. When Jesus promised to build his church on the rock bed confession that he is Lord, you and I can just empirically zoom out and go, it's working. Is God a promise keeping God or is he not? He is, amen? And it's happening. And we get to be a part of that. But we have a role to play. So it changes us like a mustard. It should produce something visible and growing in you and me that then gives shade to others, that serves other people. And so if you don't have this like cataclysmic spiritual growth in your life right now, that's okay. Play the long game with God. He will continue to change you and me from the inside out, which we'll see in just a minute, but it should eventually have an effect on other people. 
Last parable Jesus shares in verse 20, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? Jesus says, I'm so glad you asked, verse 21. It's like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Anybody start throwing sourdough around during COVID 2020? <laughs> that starter's been dead for a while, isn't it? You didn't feed it anymore. Okay, so we got into the bread-breaking stuff, right? Everyone's baking bread, and, and you can see this uh, chemical reaction that takes place as you have some type of leavening agent, yeast, and now I'm to the end of my baking knowledge, so I'm going to shut up and just talk about Jesus. But this is how it mixes in, right? Would it work if you just sprinkled a little bit on top? Nope. Would it work if you like really leavened one side but not the other? How does this work? It has to mix all the way through, right? That leaven has to mix all the way through the flowers so that the reaction happens across the board. You can't just sprinkle some Jesus on top of your life. You can't just sprinkle Jesus on one side of your life and maintain the other unchanged as your territory and not his. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's Lord of none. And so as a little bit of this gets mixed in, it changes you. It changes me from the inside out. The kingdom of God thoroughly changes us in here. We're changed in here to make an impact out there, but God does a work inside of us that at first may seem imperceptible, but then inevitably leads to change out there. I asked a few friends to study this passage with me this week and share some observations with me, and uh, one of our staff talked about the environment that bread needs to grow. Like people in Colorado have a hard time making bread because of altitude. You gotta adjust for that. It can't be too cold or too warm. The environment for growth has to be right too. God has planted us in environments of growth. Like, we need each other to continue to understand to the extent of how God has changed us. So three questions here as we close for you today. First is this, is Jesus Lord? I'm convinced he is. And the Bible says there's a day where everybody, belief aside, is going to at least recognize that and see that's the truth then, but it's also true now. And so to the non-believer, the call to you is to come to Jesus because he's moving towards you. God in Christ has moved towards you before you call to him, before you acknowledge him, before you reach out spiritually for his little tunic. God in Christ on a cross on Calvary 2,000 years ago moved all the way to you and me. And so the path to following Jesus biblically is simple, repent and believe. We turn from our ways, believe the gospel is sufficient for us, and walk in new life. But there's some Christ-adjacent tendencies we have, don't we? We talk about being Christ-centered here a lot. Sometimes we get Christ adjacent. We want to sprinkle some of that leavening on like most of our life, but not let it have its way to work all the way through. If Jesus is Lord of our lives, he's Lord of every part. Lord of our time, our finances, our emotions, our hopes and plans for the future. Second question is this. Has Jesus multiplied from you to someone else? Can you see some level of growth in you that's exponential, that's outward focused, that's beginning to make a spiritual difference in the life of other people? And again, this can be a slow process. You start small. Do you pray for someone else, even just here in the church? Are you in a small group? Do you care for other people? Are you praying for your friends and family that don't yet know Christ? Do you have a a heart for the lost? Is it growing and burdening? Can you share what Jesus has done for you in just a few sentences? Are you financially invested in seeing the Great Commission fulfilled in our lifetime? Has Jesus multiplied from you to someone else? Lastly, has Jesus changed all of you? Has Jesus changed all of you? No sprinkles, no partial changes. We're all in with him. Because on the cross that first Good Friday when the world thought it had killed Jesus, he was all in for each one of us. And Resurrection Sunday sealed that victory for you and me forever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, we're thankful for this encounter with this woman who had physical ailments, but that Jesus, you appropriately diagnosed her chief problem as a spiritual one. That the enemy had gotten a hold of her life in a way that's not even her fault. It's just part of living in a fallen world. But Jesus, you were there. Before she spoke, before she moved, you moved all the way to her, and you're doing the same thing to each one of us today. 
And so God, wherever we're at in our life with you, help us see and encounter you, Jesus, the same way. God in Christ moving towards us, initiating, loving us first, and then giving us all we need to love you in return. God, show us what this mustard seed life of multiplication is supposed to be like as we seek to be a disciple-making church. We want to make a spiritual difference in the lives of other people. We don't just want to gather and be in here and have a holy huddle once a week and then live unchanged out there. That The kingdom of God is changing us exponentially for life out there. And so increase our heart to be outward focused, not in a project sense, but in a people sense. We want to keep asking you to use us to make a spiritual difference in the lives of other people, to bring our lost friends and family members and neighbors who we love. Like we echo the prayer of Paul, these people have become dear to us. Save them now, Jesus. Reveal yourself to them in power and truth. And God, reveal to us if there's a piece of our life that hasn't been fully mixed in with you yet. Because just like you change us for out there, you change us thoroughly in here. So God, have your way with each one of us. Do your work. Stop at nothing to get our attention and keep it. That we might do what this woman does, immediately glorify you, and that we would all be astonished at all the things you do. Not most, every bit of your work. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.